Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome all to uh, this 11th Sunday after Pentecost, deep into ordinary time and our summer time, and I hope it's been good for all of you. Warm welcome to the parish of Central Saanich and to St. Mary's. Welcome to all who are watching, whichever camera you're on, I can never tell. Welcome to you all in your homes and those of you who are gathered here. Um, Lon, as you know, is away. I think this is coming near the end of his vacation, so we just want to continue to hold him and Marion in our prayers and support. We're glad they've had a little bit of time away. I look forward to their re-entry among us. And as always, I want to begin and acknowledge that we do gather on these beautiful, traditional, ancestral, and unceded lands of the Wasanic and Coast Salish peoples. We're grateful to be here, grateful to gather in the time of worship. And so we'll take a few moments of quiet and gather our hearts and then our gathering hymn, and we invite you to stand for that. In your bulletin, the chorus is printed first, but we're going to begin with the verses and then sing the chorus after each verse. I invite you to stand as a way of participating in this song and follow along with the words. <coughs> of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. <laughs> Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit 
that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in his highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. I invite you to be seated. So for our children and young people, I want to offer a prayer and a blessing for you wherever you are. So let us pray. Oh God, we know you are a God who loves children, who loves all of your children, including your adult children and your small children, and you welcome the children to come to you. We pray for all the children of our uh, families and friends and community and church family. We pray your blessing and your keeping of them at this time as we come near the end of summer, as we face fall and many difficult decisions and stresses and all the weights that those who care for these children bear. We pray your blessing on us all and your safekeeping. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. A reading from the 45th chapter of the book of Genesis. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, <clears throat> come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two year, last two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds and all that you have. <clears throat> I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, while Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Hear what the Spirit of God is saying. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Would you please join me in reading 
Psalm 133 in the bulletin. Oh, how, how good, good and pleasant, pleasant it is when brethren live, live together in unity. It is like fine oil upon the head that runs down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, and runs down upon the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon that falls upon the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has ordained the blessing, life forevermore. Hear what the Spirit of God is saying. Thanks, Thanks be to, to God. God. A reading from the 11th chapter of the book of Romans. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, <clears throat> but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may be merciful to all. Hear what the Spirit of God is saying. Thanks be to God. And would you please stand for the reading of the 15th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. <clears throat> but she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the gospel of Christ. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Let us pray. O oh God, we pray by your spirit now that our eyes would be opened and our ears unstopped and we would understand your great love for us. Come to us through your word of promise and touch our hearts, we pray. And we pray for the one who preaches, O oh God, for you know his sins are many. Amen. Well, last week I preached and joked about how we struggle to cover all of the readings in one sermon, and I just conveniently left out the Genesis passage, right? And here it comes back in this week's lectionary in an amazing story, so let me see if I can catch us up. You may recall some of the Joseph story, but it's useful to have some of the basic contours in our mind. The story begins in Canaan, modern-day Palestine, Syria, Israel, around 1600 BC. Joseph was the 11th of 12 sons of a wealthy nomad called Jacob and his wife Rachel. Joseph seems to be the favorite of his elder father who gifts him with this special coat of many colors. And you've probably seen the Sunday school, you know, <laughs> summer camp versions of this. And of course, the older brothers are jealous, right? They ridicule him. He's a dreamer. And our reading last week tells the story of Genesis 37, Joseph's brothers kidnapping him and planning to kill him, which ultimately they decide 
what's really in it for us if we kill him? Better if we sell him, then we get some money, right? So this is a sibling story par excellence. (laughs) So they sell him into slavery, and he's shipped off to who knows where. And imagine, right, the experience of Joseph in this, the loss, the betrayal, the violence, the grief, the loneliness, the hurt and the pain. And just to note, always for us, that the Bible's realistic about the human condition, right? It's not going to sugarcoat it. These are real people with real stories, real lives, real hurts, just like you and me. And God is in their midst. We skip much of the story that ensues between that story last week and our reading for this week, which is the very end. And what happens is shocking. Years later, Joseph has come to serve in a rich house in Egypt where his reputation for dreaming gets out. And indeed, Pharaoh takes notice and asks him to come help interpret some dreams that none of his courtiers can make sense of. And doing so successfully, he's promoted essentially to the rank of prime minister. It's not bad, eh? (laughs) A sold slave becoming prime minister. And then there is great famine in the land. That was the subject of the dreams. And guess who turns up looking for food? But those pesky brothers, right? (laughs) This is like a scene out of Maury Povich. You know, the DNA test comes back and you are the father. (laughs) But instead it's you are the brothers. And Joseph recognizes them first and sends everyone out and is alone, and he's crying in his room. And I love that the text gives us the detail that all of the servants of Pharaoh could hear. So this isn't a little bit of sobbing. He's losing it. And finally, he comes out, and he declares to his brothers, it's I, Joseph. And he asks about his beloved father. And then listen to this remarkable bit of scripture. I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt, but do not be distressed or angry with yourselves. For God sent me before you to preserve life. The famine has been in the land two years. There are five more in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve a remnant on earth. And he goes on and tells them he's going to put them into a bit of good land in Goshen, and they shall settle there, and they begin to weep together. And it's a reconciliation unlike really anything I've known. And how is it possible, my friends? That's kind of the question that's unsettling me in these readings. How is this possible? How is a brother sold into slavery and abandoned? And the others who come and without even asking are offered this great grace, this mercy, right? And I suggest that it is that somehow Joseph knew himself in the midst of all of his difficult plight to be held still within God's loving gaze. God's not the author of sending Joseph into slavery, but God's going to work through it. And Joseph had come somehow mysteriously to know that fact, and that enables this reconciliation unlike anything we could imagine. And it brings to mind an amazing story I read this week of the late congressman and civil rights icon John Lewis, who died just a few weeks ago. Lewis, you probably know, famously marched across the Selma Bridge in 1965, but he marched many, many times and was often beaten very badly for it. And in his last published book, he tells this amazing story. He says, of the 40 times I was arrested and jailed, one person apologized to me for their actions. Almost 48 years after the fact, Edwin Wilson, one of the attackers, wanted to come and meet with me. Wilson had apologized to our other Freedom Riders during ceremonies honoring them in South Carolina, and had often mentioned to them his wish to come and talk to me. So I welcomed him to my office in Washington, and as we sat, Wilson looked deep into my eyes, searching my expression, and said it was he who had beaten me bloody in Rock Hill in May of 1961. He said, I am so sorry for all I did that day. Can you ever forgive me? Without a moment of hesitation, I looked back in his eyes and says, I accept your apology. The man who had physically and verbally assaulted me was now seeking my approval. This was a testament to the power of love to overcome hatred. Wilson said publicly that he's glad to be able to count me as a friend, and he's expressly mentioned his gratitude that we never pressed charges that day. His life and the life of his family would have been forever changed if South Carolina had tried or convicted him. Wilson said he was glad we didn't have weapons that day because we met this man with only love and offered him our respect despite his obvious hatred. It gave him nothing to justify his anger. 
He left that day only to review it in his mind so many times over the years, 48 years in fact. He demonstrated poignantly for all to see that love, op- that love that opens its arms to heal the pain of another's suffering, not violence, has the power to ultimately disarm and to preserve integrity and to enable the truth to do its work. So what sort of a love is this, my friends, that enables this kind of reconciliation? Paul tells us a bit, I think, in our, Rome, in our reading from Romans. It's a love that God has poured out to us in Jesus Christ. And curiously, it's not a love that says, everything's fine, everyone's fine, we're all okay. Just keep trying. It's a love that faces the fact that we're not actually okay. We're hurting, we're in pain, and sometimes we're hurting and in pain, giving pain to others. And it counts us all, therefore, as guilty. Paul writes in Romans 11.32, God has imprisoned all in disobedience that he might be merciful to all. This is really remarkable. The setting for Paul's words are this big and difficult theological question. What's happening to Israel? Right at that time, right? Paul is preaching and teaching and going into synagogues, but increasingly his Jewish brothers and sisters are not responding to the message of Jesus while, meanwhile, the Gentiles are. And it creates a problem. If God is faithful to God's people, how is it all these outsiders are finding their way in? And so he says, has God rejected his own people? And you get this famous response, by no means. The Greek's a little more poignant for that, but I'll leave that for you to Google later. So for Paul, this is always about the very character of God. And I think it's so for us as well, whatever situation we're in, what unsettles us is the question of the character of God. Is God good and loving and kind towards us? Or is he unreliable or a bit harsh or judgmental or vindictive? Paul knows that God's heart is that all should be reconciled. And this, Paul says, because God has allowed some branches, in fact, to be grafted in. And that, my friends, is almost all of us who have been, through the work of Jesus, made children of God and indeed grafted in. And this gathering in of the children of God is the great work that we get a hint of already in the Joseph story. We see it most clearly in Jesus. And we even see it, I suggest, through this stunning and difficult encounter that Jesus has with this woman of Canaan. First note with me that in the Gospels, twice, Jesus praises someone as having great faith. One, with this Canaanite woman who in Mark and Luke's Gospel is a, a Syrophoenician woman and once with the centurion's servant. Each, we should note, are demonstrable outsiders in every respect. They don't fit, they don't belong. Each are written off by the people of Israel at the time as enemies. Each interrupt Jesus at his business and boldly ask for the healing that they need. And in each, Jesus responds in praising their faith and in granting that healing. It's amazing. And in the case of this woman today, Jesus brushes her off rather crudely, right? I was sent for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And the disciples are kind of shooing this person away and nodding in approval, right? Like, this isn't really what you're supposed to be about. Jesus is sent for the chosen. But hold that, hold that in one hand and hold in the other how often Jesus interacts with those seemingly not chosen, <laughs> seemingly falling to the edges of the chosen. It's an interesting question that we could do some more work on together. And the woman hears that, and she says something that I suggest is a bit like what we heard Peter say last week as he was sinking in the water. Peter says, Lord, save me, and the woman says, Lord, help me, my daughter. But at this cry of faith, And this is the cry of faith that you heard me say last week that ultimately justifies the cry to God in our pain, in our hope, in our trust. But what does this woman get but one of the harshest words of Scripture? Jesus says it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. There's a lot of wrestling with this, as you can imagine, in the commentaries. Lots of attempts to make it sound just a bit nicer. Oh, they say it's it's diminutive, right? So it's like he's calling her a little puppy. Well, that's, <laughs> that, I don't think that would be a nice term to call someone either. We, um, it, it is a slanderous term. We have, we have such a word for this in English about a female dog, and it's a word my mother would have washed my mouth out for. And it doesn't matter if you put the word little in front of it. It's not going to be heard very nicely, is it? Especially not on the lips of Jesus. 
And what's amazing, though, is that in hearing this response, the woman persists. Her faith is such that she is going to get in front of this person, Jesus, who she thinks has the power to heal. Even if the disciples push her away, even if she thinks Jesus might be pushing her away, she's going to make herself heard. And so she continues, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you've asked. And immediately her daughter is healed. What a remarkable cry for help. A cry from the depths of her heart that this Jesus could offer healing to her daughter, even though she knows herself an outsider. She knows she has no standing. She knows perhaps what we all might know as we use the old language of the BCP, the prayer of humble access, puts us all in this place, right? We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. This is what Paul knew. God's property is to have mercy. God's character is to have mercy. As our Pope Francis says, the name of God is mercy. And we, Paul says, we are all unworthy to gather, and we are all alike made worthy by God's grace in Jesus. And all means all, even this woman, and even me, and even you. And it is the mercy that the woman comes expecting, perhaps begging, even pr protesting to the only God she thinks would listen. She accepts herself as an outsider, but in finding her as such, Jesus makes her an insider. And so I suggest for all of us, we are alike outsiders. We are all licking our wounds of how we've been excluded or hurt or the violence and pain that's been done to us. And we could spend 40 years or more wallowing in that. Perhaps we need to spend some time really facing that. But I wonder, what is the hope of Joseph crying out in tears after seeing his brothers? What is the hope of John Lewis who doesn't repay violence with violence? What's the hope that Jesus offers come, comes and looks upon us, as Paul says, as sinners in need of grace? As people who are hurt and crying and in pain, the one great physician who can heal. Now, I know some of you who perhaps grew up with these words, this prayer of humble access, might have had it sort of beaten over your heads a bit, right? It can be used to sort of let's make ourselves feel more badly, right? Make yourself really grovel in it. Like the key to faith is to feel so crummy about yourself and sort of wallow in that that God knows how much you really want forgiveness. That's not what I'm suggesting here. No, my, my approach is to just simply acknowledge life makes us feel badly enough, right? <laughs> We're going to find our way there uh, sooner or later. And most of us live bound up in a kind of shame or blame about the hurts, the past wounds that we carry, certainly about our own failures. And so in this, I suggest that this prayer offers us a freedom and a liberation, to relish in the embrace of divine mercy, to find our lives transformed by this encounter. And for us, as we find ourselves seated at God's table, not pulling scraps from underneath, but in fact, seated at God's table, though we may feel like dogs, to open up and persist in offering a seat for others who were excluded, for others who feel they don't belong, to make a bit more space at this table. For this is the aim of God as set forth even before Joseph or Jacob and Esau to reconcile the world to God's self by coming in Jesus Christ with the end goal that all shall eat at God's table. And that, my friends, is the heart of our hope, the heart of our sacred story that God has made room at the table for even us who often feel we belong on the floor with the dogs. That's the story that offers us a setting within which our pain and our hurt can be healed and gives us hope that even the most unlikely of enemies can indeed be reconciled and made friends. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
suffers prayer, yet we believe your grace responds where faith and doubt unite to care. Your hands, the bloody on the cross, survive to I invite you to stand as we confess the ancient story of our faith, saying together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You can be seated. Let us pray. <clears throat> the response to the words, Lord, in your mercy, is hear our prayer. Let us pray for Christ's holy Catholic Church. In our Anglican cycle, we pray for the Scottish Episcopal Church, for Justin, our Archbishop, for Linda, our Primate, for Mark, our National Indigenous Archbishop, for Melissa, our Metropolitan, and for the Anglican Church here in Canada. In our diocesan cycle, we pray for Ansley, the diocesan administrator. We pray for the clergy and people of the Two Saints Ministry, and for the clergy and people of the Diocese of Caledonia. 
we pray for the upcoming Episcopal Synod. Lord Jesus, may your wisdom be our wisdom and your will our will, that we may seek, find, and call one who will shepherd your people, nurture reconciliation, love your creation, and speak hope to the church and the world in your name. Amen. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In our parish, we pray for our ministers, Lon and Marion, as they're on their vacation, for Brett, Bob, Lori, Logan, and Matt. We pray for all who are helping the parish to stay safe and well. We also continue to pray for our outreach programs. We pray for the worldwide Christian church, for the other Christian churches in our community, remembering especially Father Rolf and our brothers and sisters at St. Elizabeth and Our Lady of the Assumption of the Roman Catholic Parish. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We continue to pray for all those affected by the economic, social, and health consequences of the coronavirus outbreak across this country, in the United States, and around the world. And for those who are assisting the victims and working towards a vaccine. We continue to pray for all who have been or continue to be victims of discrimination, racism, and violence. We pray for help for all those experiencing homelessness, drug addiction, and mental illness. We continue to pray for those affected by conflict, disorder, and economic and social turmoil around the world. We remember especially the people of Beirut, Lebanon, as they recover from their recent horrific explosion, and also the people of Belarus, as they strive for democracy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are ill in body or in mind, for those dealing with personal challenges and issues, and for those who are known to each of us for whom prayers have been requested. We pray this week in our parish for Ken B, Lynn, Daniel, Erica, Kathy and John, Cheryl, Lisa, Doreen H, Diana A, Mike D, Brett, and Mark P. We pray for those in our parish with long-term needs, Kathy, Margaret, Sherry, Ted, Ed B, and Pat M. We also pray for friends and family beyond the parish whose names are listed in the bulletin. And if there are any for whom you are concerned, please mention their names now, either silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember before you, O Lord, all your servants departed this life in your faith and fear. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we commemorate the 75th anniversary of VJ, or Victory in Japan Day, ending World War II, let us pray for peace in the world. O God, it is your will to hold both heaven and earth in a single place, peace. Let the design of your great love shine on the waste of our wraths and sorrows and give peace to your church, peace among the nations, peace in our homes, and peace in our hearts. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Remember, Lord, all your people. Strengthen all who are in tribulation, necessity, or distress. Remember for good those who love us and those who hate us, and those who have asked us, unworthy as we are, to pray for them. Remember especially, Lord, those whom we have forgotten. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The service continues with the offertory in the bulletin.
Loving God and Father, you have adopted us to be your heirs. Accept all we offer you this day and give us grace to live as your faithful children. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And let us pray together the prayer of the day. Almighty God, you have broken the tyranny of sin and sent into our hearts the spirit of your Son. Give us grace to dedicate our freedom to your service, that all people may know the glorious liberty of the children of God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Father, I adore you. I Gathering our prayers and praises into one, let us pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. Deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Glory to God, whose love working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve God. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. for joining us for our service. Clergy contact information is available on the screen and at the parish website at parishcs.ca. Don't forget there's another Come Together session this week on Wednesday. Outreach and regular offerings are most appreciated, whether they're mailed in, dropped off to the church, or brought to a service. Contact information for both churches is available on the screen. Remember to be kind, be calm, and stay safe. Have a great week. Blessings.